wasn't used to me putting down her down for a nap because we have her mm -hmm. her nap time on Saturday and Sunday and those are spending days anyway, so we don't usually do yeah. naps. Yeah, it's not they nice. usually fall asleep in the cars when they nap on weekends. Mm -hmm. So we had to get into the routine of taking a nap and so she got up once and I just picked her up and put her out and back in her bed and then she didn't come out again. Wow. It's amazing. So, Amazing. Did you guys it. see any other challenging behaviors that you like? Oh, sorry. Were able to like prevent or yeah. So we had one thing where she, she gets really excited and she'll bite, and it's not really to get. She just gets overwhelmed, and so she'll bite. And so we've been working on like only give kisses, and so she stopped and she only gave kisses, and then she went and gave him a kiss too. So she was really excited mm -hmm. about it. So. So good. instead of like focusing on the negative, you focused yeah. on the positive, like immediately yeah, so what you wanted like, her to do. Bite. Yeah. You're like only give kisses, and she Boom. stopped and she gave a kiss, and then she was. You're like, like they want me to give kisses. That's so good. So, so good. good. We also worked on that two option, the two fun options. Yeah. And that worked. Really that worked well. good too. Yeah. yeah. Good. Anything? Did you guys notice anything? Your kids are perfect for TV. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I did one of the things you suggested with our daughter was having a hard time leaving. Yesterday we played, we had a play date with friends and it was time to go. And so I, I was just like, do you want to climb in through the trunk? And she was like, yeah, but oh she still gosh. like was weeping like the, the whole time. She was so. like, sure, I'll leave, but I'm just going to still cry <laughs> and climb in through the trunk. But you know what? It's okay but to be left, sad as so. long as you comply, you know? <laughs> as long as you get in the car, you can still be sad. It's totally fine. Um, okay, good, 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 good. Um, I know it's been crazy. It's the end of the semester, and you guys are student parents. At least half of you are. Um, so I get it. Um, okay, so we talked about preventing, and we talked about like encouraging more of the behavior that we wanted to see. And this week, we're going to talk about teaching. So how we can um, use what we've learned before and know about function to teach new skills and also to respond in a way that's not reinforcing the behavior. So I already asked that question. Okay, so now that you know the function of the behavior, so say like in that situation with the biting, she seemed overstimulating, so part of it was she needed like the ability to regulate her emotions or to, you know, like when she's overwhelmed, instead of biting, she can do this or whatever, she can kiss or whatever. But also you saw that it was kind of like an attention thing because as soon as you put your attention somewhere else, then she responded differently. So like the function of behavior, it might be overstimulation or it might be attention, and you can kind of just like play with different scenarios. But now that we know what the function could possibly be, what we've hypothesized it to be, how can we prevent it? So um, if this is something I'm going to pick on you because it's like a very, really good, really clear example. Um, if she, say she did that all the time, how could we prevent it? Like before something that overwhelms her, I'm just gonna pretend something overwhelms her like a couple times a day and maybe it's like a transition or something and she bites. So before that transition happens, how can we prevent the problem behavior by helping her with skills? And then like in those moments before anything negative happens, we're teaching her how she can calm her body in different ways. So like what you're doing with kisses, it's beautiful. Um, and then, um, what, what skills do I even need to help them with? So when we know the function, we know the function is attention or if the function is overstimulation and not being able to self-regulate, then we know we can either teach, okay, this is how you can calm your body, or we know we can teach, um, this is what you can do for attention. You can say, mom, I need a hug. Um, so that's why we, knowing the function of the different behaviors is going to be so helpful in what we need to teach because if we got the function wrong, then we're going to teach something that they don't necessarily need for that behavior. Um, so some examples, like in a preschool setting, um, well, Blanding, tell me, what, what problems do you see a lot in some of your classes that come up every day or every transition? Overreacting. Okay, so like meltdown behavior? Yeah. Okay. Do they cry, scream, hit, or is it more of like a, is it internalizing or externalizing? Like do they lash out or do they like melt down and crumble with inside themselves? Lash out. Lash out. Okay, cool. Um, and obviously you're probably seeing both, but you know, if we can start with the 
the worst behavior. Let's start there. So um, lashing out. So if a child is lashing out, say it's because, maybe it's because as you observe them, what happens before the behavior is like a transition's coming and then the behavior happens, they start lashing out. And then the way you respond to the behavior usually is you like hold them and sit them down and, and like leave them back from the group. So maybe in that case, their function of behavior is one-on-one -on -one attention. They lash out because they need one-on-one -on -one attention or something like that. So what new skills can you teach? How can you get one-on-one -on -one attention? How can you prevent it by grabbing the child's hand and giving that one-on-one -on -one attention before the behavior happens? And then what can I do when it occurs? You would want to do something that's less, enforcing, less reinforcing um, and not give them a lot of attention. But I'm gonna come back to that example with a lot of different other functions in a minute. Okay, so the first thing you do is prevent, and we talked about that like um, with giving choices and with focusing on what we want. And oh, I forgot my workbook downstairs, so. Um, tell me if I'm skipping over something really awesome. Um, actually, I'm not sure where you're at to begin with. Okay. We can just look take it. this one. We can that? share. Okay. <laughs> okay, if you're dying to write notes, just let me know. I will. Okay, sorry. Um, okay, so we are after the You Are Amazing and the Reflection. And we're on to new skills. We haven't got quite to there yet. So start on page 11. Okay, so we talked about preventing, and then now we're talking about what to teach. So what skills are missing? What are the new skills? Um, in your workbook, it says what skills do they need to communicate? What skills do they need to communicate their need? Sorry, that's like a typo. Their need appropriately. Um, what areas do they need to support developing? So if they're having meltdowns at home or at school, and the function of their behavior, maybe it's not attention or maybe it's not obtaining like an object or something, maybe they're trying to escape something. They're escaping dinner time or they're escaping um, small groups in a childcare setting. That's a big one. So what skills are they missing? They're missing the skill of being able to um, sit with a group or they're missing the skill to be able to say, I don't like something, but I still have to do it. And so that's a skill that we have to have in life, right? We sometimes have to do things that we don't want to do, um, and sometimes these kids aren't able to do that skill. And so just identify right now some of the skills that are missing in some of these big situations. So if a behavior is happening in this transition often, what skill do they need in order to act in that behavior appropriately? Um, what areas do they need support developing? So if a child's melting down every time, what, what, when do you guys see meltdowns? Every time you tell them no. Okay, so handling disappointment would be the new skill, right? Because every single time you tell him no, he's not able to regulate his frustrations or handle disappointment. So it's usually, I mean, handling disappointment is probably the number one skill on a like positive behavior support plan that I teach the children because, well, not that I teach the children, that I put in their plan to help them develop new skills because it is something that like adults struggle with. Like you see people like driving in the car and you know, my husband just like flips a lid, like, wow. And it's like, okay, like handle disappointment is the new skill that we need. <laughs> it's too late now, but we can start with our two year old, you know? Um, it's something that we all do. We all have like these outbursts of anger, but the sooner we can regulate our frustration in most situations, the better we're gonna perform in school and with peers and with our family. So, handling disappointment is a huge skill. Um, is there any other times or like, um, well, so for, for my son, his biggest meltdown is when the TV goes off, which, like I said last week, is a whole thing in, its, in, its, in and of itself because it activates a center of the brain that shouldn't be active for that long with a two-year-old. And so, like, I know putting him in front of a show, he's gonna react like that, but he also enjoys it, so I'm like, mm, sometimes I just do it anyway. Anyway, so um, what I do with him is I do all the things to prevent, right? It's like, okay, five minutes, we're gonna turn off the show. In two minutes, we're gonna do this, and I tell him the fun thing we're gonna do. Um, but when the TV goes off, he still has a meltdown. Every single time, no matter how many times I've prevented it. And so in this situation, I prevented, it didn't go away, the new skill that he needs to learn is how to handle disappointment specifically when the TV goes off. 
So how am, I how am I gonna teach that new skill? And that's what we start to get into like very creative ways for our children um, to help them with these missing skills in order to function in their daily lives. Um, so, let's see. Um, you jot down anything that comes to mind on those, but then we gotta figure out how and when to teach these skills. So if anyone has any like times or whatever that we wanna discuss, shout them out, just tell me. It's like, will be better if my examples can benefit you. Um, I have a lot of examples though. So on one kid's behavior support plan in a preschool right now, the new skill that he needs is to not hit, maybe you guys have this problem, blending and parents, but when he's frustrated, like if someone takes his toy or if a tower knocks down, he'll lash out and he'll hit another kid. Um, and sometimes that turns into hitting a parent or something like, they're so mad you pick them up and then they just start hitting you on the back or something. Um, and so the skill that he needs is to um, handle disappointment. So here is, I mean, it's, it goes back to handling disappointment, but it's in a different scenario. So the way that we teach this skill right now is I have this scenario. It's a role play scenario. We laminated it. It says every day do this with this child five times a day in the morning when they're playing really well. Okay, so it's like this, it's, it's just like this role play and it's just like, Oh, you're building that tower. It's so awesome. So you do something with the, with the child, like that's super fun for them. And then we are actually like saying, okay, well, if I add this piece here, how would you feel? And they're like, oh, I wouldn't really like that. And then you like add the piece there in a controlled setting and try to help them through that moment. Or you knock down their tower. It sounds terrible, but in a controlled setting where you can probe them before and be like, what would you do if, and they say, oh, I would try this. And if they're not ready, then they'll knock it over. But just like, tr just like practice these actual things that happen with their peers so they're prepared for it with their peers and not hitting their peers. It sounds crazy, but that is how we're teaching this skill with this kid. And so we're sitting down with him five times every single morning when he's playing really good and just going through the role play. So sometimes it's not knocking over his tower, but it's like he doesn't even want one child to put one specific block on his tower that he's building, even if he's trying to play with someone else. So the skill that he's missing is also being able to play with friends. And so part of that is being flexible and letting them have part of the play too. Um, and so to teach flexibility, you have to have them be flexible with you, right? Or have another peer come over and try to facilitate it together. Um, so there's lots of creative, interesting ways to do it, and you have to figure out what works for each kid. And if knocking over their tower is not gonna work, then don't do it, you know? Like for this kid, he, he needs practice, but if you probe all the right questions before, he will be able to whew, calm down and get through it. So, how and when to teach is gonna be different, and we can go over any of your examples. Um, but on the next page is some more practice. So, oh, hold up. Okay, yeah. Okay, we're gonna do the examples and then we'll come to this. Okay, so it says Linus is splashing in a bowl of water. So this is our same examples from last time. He's laughing and humming as he plays and his teacher takes away the bowl of water and Linus begins to cry and engage in tantrum behavior. The teacher immediately returns the bowl of water. So the child is trying to communicate that they want to play with the bowl of water. We determined this last time. The new skill that's needed is what? What do you guys think the new skill could be? Handling disappointment. It always goes back to handling disappointment, doesn't it? Um, another word for that is self-regulating your body um, when you're frustrated. Um, and so it's just basically being able to calm down or cope with disappointing things. Handling disappointment. So how and when are we going to teach that? So first of all, you would do some of the preventative things like say, okay, I'm going to take away the bowl of water and you can be sad, but here's what, you know, your options are or whatever. Um, other things you can do is to teach the new skill is like, a bit, this seems like w kind of a weird way to teach this new skill, but have like a timer and a visual schedule of this is how long this activity lasts and when it's done, we move on to this activity because that can kind of help them realize, okay, I have this much time and then it's done um, instead of it like springing on them. Um, okay, but I mean, you can also do the thing that I just talked about with that other boy where you just practice saying, okay, we're going to take it away and just really sit there in those moments and prepare him for the event and then have it go through and be like, I know it's hard, but you did so good and just reinforce how good he did handling the disappointment. 
Okay, number two, the child at the chur- at church will not go to the church class. As soon as it's time to go to the, his individual class, he cries and cries, and his mom can't stay with him, so he ends up going to class with her. This happens every week. So the child is trying to communicate that he's escape- you know, he's escaping class, right? Um, so what is the new skill needed? Being away from mom. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, exactly. So um, being away from mom, being able to go to his class or whatever, because I mean, the same behavior could happen in preschool or in kindergarten or in first grade. And like legit, my aunt sat with her daughter every single day of kindergarten the entire time. Do you guys have time for that? Ain't nobody got time for that. That's all I have to say that. Um, I'm like, uh, uh-uh, nope. So this child really needs this skill. And so what the new skill needed is, you know, to be away from his mom and to be able to go to this class by himself. How are we going to teach it? So the way that this particular mom taught it was by, it's called like most to least prompting. So she stayed with him for like 15 minutes. And then the next time she stayed with him for like 10 minutes. And the next time she stayed with him for five minutes. But at the same time of like staying with him and then like being like, okay, I'll come back or whatever, and then staying with him and then saying, I'll come back. She's also preventing the behavior by giving him incentive like, oh, you can bring this special bag with you to class today, or you can bring this special book with you to class today. Um, And so there's preventative measures happening, but then there's also these new skills happening where um, she's basically, it's called scaffolding, where she's adding that support that the child needs and staying with the child for an amount of time that helps him, and then it prepares him for the next week to be shorter, and the next week to be shorter, and the next week to be shorter. Because... Is it better to have, you know, 15 minutes this week and 10 minutes next week or him ending up in your class crying the whole time? Sometimes you're like, oh, I don't have 15 minutes. But if you can do 15 minutes now, it's going to stop you from doing three hours every single Sunday or Saturday or Wednesday, whatever day you go to church. Um, Okay. The child won't. Oh, yeah. Go. Um, What would the dialogue, like what would be an appropriate dialogue with that? Because I know you don't want to distract your child and then just abandon. Yeah, 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 yeah. But what would be like a good dialogue, like when your kids, you can see they're starting to melt down, mm-hmm. but you're still trying to mean like, I'm leaving right now. Yeah, yeah. Like oh, so what would be a good I mean, dialogue to I, help your child not melt I don't know. Like do any of you guys have a situation like this where you leave your child like in a church class? Yeah, nursery? Yeah. Or yeah, okay. We don't um, have problems with it anymore, but we used No, to. I did too. So the best thing, it seems like it's going to escalate the behavior. The best thing to do is to say, okay, I'm going to leave now. Because if they turn around and see that you're gone 10 minutes later, it's causing this mistrust. And you don't want the mistrust. So, I mean, you, like, you probably know about like, stuff like that with like, attachment and stuff. But you, like, the more open you are, like in daycare, when the parent would sneak out, it seems better for the parent because you don't see them cry. But in 10 minutes, they're going to lose it, you know? Um, so... It's like with my son, I would stay with him. I think I stayed with him like the whole time the week before he was supposed to go or something. And then the next time it was like half the time. And he struggled and I'm not going to say he like went without a problem, but he's two and a half now and he goes without a problem the whole time. He loves it. He runs to it and loves it. Um, And so I say like, okay, um, I got to go to my class now. So you're going to go here. And then I just like help him feel safe. So I get him in an activity feeling safe. And then I help him feel safe with another adult before I leave. But, I mean, he still might be crying, but I can at least go, you're going to sit with her, and I'm going to leave. Or you're going to sit with him, and I'm going to leave. And he's going to cry. And, like, the first couple of weeks, I mean, he cried, and I could hear it. And it was so sad. But if I let him cry for 10 minutes and then go in, the next time he's going to cry for 15 minutes, and then I'm going to go in. So I only, like, if it got bad enough that they had to get me, I would go to him. But they felt comfortable. Like I said, okay, just, like, let me know. If you're not comfortable, come get me. But they said that if they felt comfortable, and, like, 10 minutes after that, like, I left because I couldn't hear it. 10 minutes after that, they sent me a picture of him playing. So it also helps, like, if you, like, have a relationship or, like, a trust with, like, the people. Um, But, like, in this situation with an older child, um, talking to the teacher beforehand and being like, you know, he really struggles with this. This would help him. And then set up those supports before, like on a Wednesday night, just call her up and be like, okay, this would help him. Like I have this special thing that you can have for him so that he feels more safe there. Um, and so that can help too, like preventative stuff, but always just be like, okay, when we go in, you kind of prepare him. 
I'm going to go in, and then in a minute, mommy's going to leave, or in 10 minutes, mommy's going to leave. So you tell them at the beginning, and then when you leave, you tell them again. So the same thing can happen in a school class. If you're having trouble with your kid going to school or preschool or daycare or anything like that, um, I feel like it's more common in church classes because these people aren't trained. It's once a week, so they're not as familiar as they are with childcare. So that's why it happens, like, a lot. And also, sometimes people just aren't comfortable with your crying kids, so then you're not uncomfortable, and it's just really awkward. Um, okay, any other questions on that? Child, or not child number three, number three. Child won't, won't stay in bed. Mom puts the child to bed. The child comes out every few minutes. Mom hugs the child, talks to them, carries them back to bed. The child keeps doing it. The function, what is the child trying to communicate? Escape, yeah, they don't want to go to bed. This is the story of my life. Um, legit, they end up in my room every single night, so I'm terrible to teach this one because I'm not taking my own advice. Um, okay, the new skill needed is, well, it depends on what you want the new skill to be. Like, is the new skill that they need to be in their own room, in their own bed? Is there a new skill that they need to sleep throughout the night? So maybe it's like whatever you're trying to teach them. So for us right now, it's like, let's just get nine hours, you know, so I've given up on where right now. Nap times, I'm very consistent, but bed times, not so much. He sleeps on the dog bed in my room. Um, but the new skill needed is, and the dogs sleep on me, so it's just really great. <laughs> um, so the new skill needed is, in this situation, let's say the child needs to sleep in his room. How are we going to teach it? So one way when I was being really good at this um, is encourage the behavior you want, right? So to teach the new skill, I had him lay down. It was like in the middle of the day, so he's like not going to bed, not, not worried about it. Lay down, took a picture of him sleeping. And then I hung this picture above his bed and focused so much on it, like, oh my goodness, look, you were sleeping. And I just all day long was like, look, you're sleeping in your bed. This is so cool. You're sleeping in your bed. And then when it was bedtime, he was like actually really excited to go sleep in his bed because I had focused on him sleeping in his bed in that picture like all day. The excitement wore off, so I needed to get creative again. Um, but that was one of the ways to teach that new skill. Another way is to like have, um, to, like, have a comfort item that they like just for their bed. Um, another way that we did is like he hated bedtime so much that we made a routine so that bedtime would be way more fun. And so it was like five things that he liked to do and then bedtime. And so it wasn't such a negative association for him. It was like, oh, we get to read a book and we get a now, now the chart needs to be for brushing teeth because he's like fine going and getting in his covers, but brushing his teeth is like the thing. It used to be fun, but it's not fun anymore. Um, anyway, so just like creating these things about it. So that's like some of the ways you can teach that new skill. That wasn't very good because I'm like, oh yeah, I'm not doing these things. So what are some ways that work for you guys like to teach a new skill like bedtime? We have a routine. Routine, yeah. Our kids seem to respond to it very well. Routines are really good, especially if you keep up with them, because that's what a routine it's is for. Yeah, it's been five years. Um, the one problem we were having, though, is our five-year-old mm -hmm. would get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom or whatever, because we told him he could get out of bed to go to the bathroom. Yeah. But then he wants to come and visit with me before he goes back to bed, which is great. Escape. And and he, he wants me to tuck him back in and give him a kiss mm -hmm. and everything. Yeah. And so um, what I was what I've done since we started doing this, and he's not bothered me much. I told him I says it's okay. Everybody has to get up and go potty in the middle of the night, but it's the middle of the night, so we have to go back to sleep. Mm -hmm. And I said so you can get up. It's fine. And you do this before he goes to bed. Uh huh. And then you just, if you have to go potty, go potty, and then just go back to your bed. And it's, and it's fine. That's so good. And it's okay. And he hasn't. That's so good. Well, the other night, so I got up in the middle of the night and had to go to the bathroom. And did you make him tuck you back in? No, I went in <laughs> at night and I checked on him and my son happened to be awake. And he goes, mommy, why are you in my room? And I said, well, I had to go to the bathroom. So I thought I would just <laughs> check and make sure you were okay. And he goes, it's okay. Everyone has to go potty. <laughs> but you should go back to bed. <laughs> oh, that is so cute. So. That's, see, now he's teaching you. He's learning <laughs> that new skill. That is so cute. I love that. Um, yeah. Great, great, great. Okay, so um, let's go back to an example where the child is hitting because they're fresh. Okay, hold on. Let me just think about this for a second. 
Oh, I'll just use the example that's on here. That'll make it easier. Okay, so when we can't honor the meaning of behavior. So sometimes we can figure out what the child is trying to communicate, but we cannot honor it. So say they don't want to go to school, and that is the function of their behavior. Can we just say, all right, never have to go to school again? Or like they don't want to do their chores. And, and the way that they're like doing their behavior, you know that's what they're trying to communicate. But the new skill isn't just saying, I don't want to do my chores instead of screaming and damaging the wall. So it needs to go beyond that. It's like doing your chores even when you're frustrated. So even though like the function of the behavior is they're trying to communicate they don't want to do their chores, we have to go a step further and help them do the behavior that we need them to do um, in an appropriate way. So this can be a difficult part of the approach. Your child may want to communicate the message. Just like I said, I don't want to go to school or class um, when you're trying to drop them off at class. So we don't teach them to say nicely, like, I don't want to go to school, please. Um, but the new skill is following the schedule, handling disappointment, or opening up about fear. So that's kind of like what you just said about bedtime. It's like, like he doesn't, like, he, he felt kind of worried about going to the bathroom in the middle of the night. So you don't teach him necessarily that he can't go to the bathroom in the night. You just teach him it's okay. So he, like, opened up about that fear, kind of. Um, and so on these occasions, tell the child you know what he or she is feeling or wanting and then restating the rule. So you have to go to, or you must go to school, but you can choose if I walk with you in or drop you off here. So it goes back to you have to do this, but you can do one of those preventative strategies like the two choices. Um, and then another new skill might just be regulating disappointment. So when we can't honor the behavior and we try these things and it's still not working, that's when you say you can do this or I can help you. And then if they don't do this, then you help them, which sometimes means physically carrying them to the place. And we're going to talk about both the new consequences. Oh, I love the consequences section. Okay, so first, when to teach. Um, so this is so good because you just shared this example, basically. I don't need to write it on the board. It's right here in front of me. I just feel like pointing at it. So when, okay, bring this with me. Okay, so right here, oh. Can, can you, is it annoying to move the camera? Okay, cool. Um, okay, so right here is before bedtime, before the behavior happens. The behavior, so the behavior in this example was the child would wake up in the night and then she'd have to redo the bedtime routine, okay? So before bedtime, it's the green arrow moment. Things are still happening. Things are still really, really, really good right here, okay? But then, you know, he's like on his way to the bathroom here and then, in the red arrow moment, okay, he just went to the bathroom and now he wants me to redo the whole bedtime routine. He's not crying, he's not hitting, but this is a challenging behavior because you don't want to have to redo the bedtime routine every single night. So here is the red arrow moment. The behavior's already happened. This is not where you give the monologue or the lecture because that's reinforcing. When you sit down and say, you can go to the bathroom, but I don't have to do this and this and this, you're giving him all that attention right here. Okay, so then he's gonna continue to do it because he wants that attention. But since you did it here and you gave them all the attention here, that's the new time to teach the new skill, to talk about your options, and then it's not reinforcing. So beautiful example because you did it just beautifully. Um, same thing happens with hitting or, okay, so in the preschool situation, if a child or, you know, this is just cousins, friends, child takes another toy and, toy and the child always hits when it's time to share, share or always screams or always yells. Um, after the child yells in the red arrow moment is not the time to teach the behavior because as soon as you take the child, give them eye contact, put them down and say, we don't hit, we do this, you're giving them so much attention for that behavior and you're focusing all your attention on that behavior. So the time to teach it, like we're going to acknowledge that it happened and remove them from the situation, but we're not going to do a monologue, we're not going to do a lecture, we're not going to try to like, do you see how this person's feeling? I mean, that's the traditional way, that's the way that we think this is how we need a parent. Like when we're at the park and another parent sees our kid hit another kid, they want us to sit them down and, you know, do a lecture. But it's reinforcing the behavior. Behavior's already happened, so we put a limit and then we move on. So the teaching happens in the green arrow moment. So when you get to the park and your child usually has this situation happen, you just say, all right, we're going to play at the park today. You tell them what the behavior, like what they're allowed to do. You can play on the side, you can play on the swings, you can play with Johnny. But if you hit Johnny, then we're going to leave the park. And so here's where you give that lecture that you'd usually do at the red arrow moment to talk about all the behaviors that are probably maybe going to happen. Or like 
when it's time to share, we need to share. If we can't share, we're going to have to play at a different part of the playground. Um, and then when it starts to get yellow, you can prompt that behavior that you taught. So it's like, there's, they're like, you can tell they're starting to get frustrated about like taking turns on the swing or something. So you say, oh, remember, we got to share. So you can take a turn here, but if you don't take a turn, you're going to have to go somewhere else. And then the red, if it happens, he hits the person because they're sharing, you remove them, you put them on the curb and you walk away or you just hold them there and you give no negative or positive attention to it. You don't need to get angry. You don't need to swing them around. You just pull them out and keep it super neutral because you want that red arrow moment to be the least reinforcing part of the scenario. So then once they start calming down again, then you can be like, all right, what happened? This happened. And now you need to play somewhere else. And then you just let it go back to the green arrow moment so you can prevent behaviors again. But you never want to teach in the red arrow moment, which is so backwards to what we usually do. Um, but the point of this method is because it's not reinforcing, A, and B, when they're in that red arrow moment, their emotions are so far gone that anything you're saying to them is not clicking. They're not able to process, oh, I shouldn't, like that person's feeling that way because of this. Um, oh, I feel really bad. You know, they, they're in this part of their brain. They're not able to process like, oh yeah, that child feels sad. I should feel sad. If you can tell they're still in that yellow area where you can still talk, get through to them, you can try something. But if they're so far gone, do not even try it. Um, so like, did I tell you the story about my son when he like collapsed on the floor and he was like so sad and he was like, <laughs> because um, I wouldn't walk with him in the backyard. The things that two year olds get mad about. Um, so he was in that red arrow moment. So if I sat there and tried to explain to him, even though he didn't hit anyone, he's not in trouble. But if I sat there and tried to explain to him, honey, the reason why I'm not there with you is because I had to do this, this, and this. Um, and you need to not cry. And you have all these choices. And I'm doing this lecture in the red arrow moment. It's not going to get through to him at all. He's not there. And so I had to, like, get him back to a green arrow moment where I could talk about, oh, the reason why I did that is because I had a feed sister or whatever. So hopefully that makes, does that make sense? That was like total like mind blow for me because I'm like, what? Yeah. So how would this be different if you see like a new, um, new behavior. bad, yeah, a new yes. behavior yes. that just popped up? Absolutely. Cause you want to set the limit, right? Mm -hmm. You just don't give so much attention to the limit. So let me see if I did this in here. I don't think I did. Okay, but um, absolutely. So this is kind of what it would look like. So say your child has never bit or hit somebody. Uh, we're gonna do bite, because that's kind of more extreme. So your child, <laughs> my kid bit a kid at church. Um, <laughs> I forgot about that. Okay, so your child like bites someone for the first time and you didn't prepare them in the green arrow moment, you know? So usually when we're doing like a behavior plan where we're preparing them every single time we go to the park, it's because negative behavior is happening every time we go to the park, okay? Scratch that, pretend your child is perfect all the time, and then all of a sudden they bite someone. So obviously you missed the green arrow moment because you weren't seeing this coming. So what you do is you say, it doesn't, okay, so first of all, it doesn't matter if they bit someone on accident or they bit someone on purpose, right? If we look at someone like you bit them on accident. <laughs> okay, actually, <laughs> this, I didn't even think of this. I freaking bit my baby's finger today because I was trying to take this cute picture where we're both eating a donut and I bit her finger. Oh my gosh. Look at my Instagram. It is so sad. Okay. So, <laughs> so I mean, it can be an accident. So, so there's an example. Sometimes, you know, maybe we're playing house or something and you accidentally bite someone. Would you react the same way if your child bites someone on accident as if they bit someone on purpose? Probably not. So let's always assume the good in our child because if we handle it positively, it's not going to blow up as much. So we start with, oh, it looks like you were telling your, your friend to move. So you like, it looks like you were trying to blank. So, someone give me an example that this can relate to them. What's something where they, like, do a behavior that maybe would never happen before? Or something that, ha like, has come up, like, would maybe a biting or hitting or something? Like, all of a sudden they shove a kid? 
Okay, like first time ever. It's type yeah. of thing. Or like it's more not like as often. Moving, yeah, yeah, yeah. She, like, okay, the ground, so in this situation, trying, like, if you did it on accident, we'd probably be nicer about it, right? Versus did it on purpose. Like if my kid's walking and he's, you know, oops, oopsies. Um, he goes, sorry, sis, sorry, sis. And I'm like, no, first of all, mm -mm, that's not going to get you out of anything. Go make it better. <laughs> no, but anyways, okay, tangent. Um, I hate when you just say, say sorry to the kid. And that's like enough to be like, okay, because they don't even, they just say sorry and like run off. I always say, what can you do to make them feel better? And so they have to like do something. Anyways, that's a separate thing. Okay. So with, um, oh gosh, my mind is like squirrel. Um, big sister, little brother, right? Okay. So if little Big sister is like hits or pushes over the little brother. You don't, you didn't see it. You don't know if it's accident or purpose. Maybe you did, but you first say like, oh, you pushed over. Oh, okay. Wait, stop back up. First thing you do is go to the victim. Okay. Give all the attention to the victim first. And we also want to teach a victim assertiveness. So obviously the baby's not talking yet, but you can say, did you like that? And if the child's old enough, the child can say no. And then you say, okay, you need to tell them I didn't like that. So you go to the victim first and teach them assertiveness. So you give attention here because the child who hit doesn't need the attention first because they realize, oh, I'm going to get attention for hitting someone. You go to the person. So do you think they're really mad at this person for taking a toy or something and they push them. And then the child who took the toy gets the attention first um, because you don't want to reward the hitting behavior, whatever. Okay, so... You go to the victim first, are you okay? And then she didn't like it. Then you go back to the person you say, okay, he didn't like it. It looks like you were trying to go across the couch, but you accidentally, or you push, you don't even have to put it accidentally if you don't feel like it. You push your sibling down and now they're feeling sad. So then you set the limit, we don't push. If you want to get across the couch, you can, and you tell them what the behavior they can do. Then you kind of set the limit again. You say, if you push again, then this is the consequence. Does that make sense? So you're not giving a ton of talk about it, but it's very straightforward. Like set the limit, say what they can do to communicate the behavior. So it's kind of like teaching the new skill right then. It's like stopping it and saying, here's what you can do. Instead of just stopping it or just punishing, we're stopping it and saying, here's how you can do it. But if you do it again, <coughs> then you fall through the consequence. And then you practice it. So right then you say, show me how you can get by without pushing them over. And you have them do it right then. Um, trying to think of another example. The playground. I mean, it's always some kid at the playground, right? And you feel like super, like the other parents are watching you. What are you going to do to this kid? Because you, they just hurt my kid. Um, so you go up to the child who got hurt. Maybe it's a stranger and you say, did you like that? And they didn't like that. Okay, you can say, I didn't like that. And then you go to the child who hurt and you say, they didn't like that. It looks like you were trying to take a turn on the swing, but instead you hit this friend. We don't hit, but we can either wait for a turn or we can try it again in, or, or we can try another swing or something like that. And then they can choose, okay, if you're gonna wait for a turn, okay, let's practice waiting. Okay, so that's how we do that. Okay, so when to teach green arrow moments? Oh. Wow, I had all sorts of slides on that. Cool. Um, I'll know that for next time. Okay, so with the logical consequences on page 13. So logical consequences. How are, they, how are logical consequences different from punishment? Consequences are meant to teach. Okay, so for example, in our lifetime, when we have a consequence, we are trying to learn from it, right? So if we are, um, if we get a speeding ticket and then our insurance goes up, we got a consequence that we're learning from. We know we are not going to speed again, right? It's related to the behavior that we were doing. If we got a speeding ticket and um, our internet shut off for a month, that doesn't make any sense, right? It's not teaching us to not speed, it's teaching us to not do anything wrong because, our, you know, it's just like, it's just weird. It's like not related. But a lot of times we're doing that with our kids in our classrooms and in our um, homes because we're just trying to think of something that's a punishment and it's not necessarily relatable. And so it's not actually teaching 
the, the new skill or teaching um, the child to not do the thing that they were doing. It just teaches them that they did something wrong, but not necessarily what they did wrong or whatever. Okay, so um, it's the alternative to punishment. So logical consequences are, I think I put it on here, maybe not. But these, this is really good, so write this down. Relatable, hold up, <laughs> hold that really powerful thought. Um, relatable, reasonable, and respectful. Okay, so consequences should, should not be punitive. Um, I ho heard a teacher the other day say, okay, if these two are wrestling, and I told them if they wrestle again, then they're going to have to come clean up the toddler playground. I'm like, what? That's, like, punitive, first of all. Like, put on your red jumpsuit and come clean up trash on my playground because you were wrestling? I'm like, first of all, that's, like, a totally normal behavior for a child to wrestle. And second of all, they're not in your classroom. They're, like, four classrooms out of your classroom. So, no, that's a terrible idea. Um, but if they were throwing garbage into the toddler classroom and you say, if you throw garbage into this classroom, then you need to come clean up the classroom, that's relatable. So there's a place for something like that if it's relatable and respectful and, re and what was the third one? Reasonable. Respectful, reasonable. reasonable. Yeah. Okay, so reasonable is like, so if a child throws <coughs> garbage into the preschool classroom or whatever, they're not on garbage duty the rest of the day. That's where the reasonable comes in. It's not like, okay, you hit, you hit this friend, now you're grounded from this for a whole month. It's not reasonable, it's just not related. You know, it just doesn't make sense. Okay, so consequences are very important, though, because it teaches children that choices have consequences. And our kids need to know that, because in this world, sometimes we let them get away with stuff or we protect them from consequences, but choices have consequences. And so if they learn that they can get out of any consequence that they're ever given, then they're going to really feel it when they're on their own, right? Because if you don't pay your gas bill, your gas is going to shut off. There's consequences for every choice you make. If you're kind to your friends, then your friends will be kind to you. They're positive and negative. All of our choices have consequences. So we also need to teach them that he or she is responsible and in control for their own behavior. So saying stuff like, um, don't, make me mad, don't make me be mad at you is taking away the choice from them or it's taking away, yeah, no, from you or stuff. Basically, it's like you're in control of your behavior and they're in control of yours. So if you choose to be mad, that's not on them. That's not, that's, that's separate. So that you're all responsible for your own choices and consequences. Okay, only select options that you're willing to enforce. So you're in the grocery store and you say, okay, if you scream or cry or run away, then we have to leave immediately. It's a great consequence. They're going to learn to not do that unless they're, function is escape, obviously. But if they're just like trying to get candy and you leave because they ran away and didn't listen, that's great. But if you're not willing to leave, then don't make that the consequence. My husband is really kind of bad at this because, um, sorry if you ever watch this, um, what was I going to say? Um, he says stuff like, okay, if you do that again, then, um, oh, I'm trying to think of like a recent example. Like if you do that again, then I'm gonna leave you home or something. Or like if you don't wanna come get in the car, then I'm gonna leave you home. Would he ever leave the kid home? No. So it's a terrible, terrible, terrible consequence. <laughs> I'm sorry to call you out. <laughs> but it's, they know, they know you're not gonna leave them home and so it's not gonna work. But we do stuff like this all the time. All of us are guilty of it. It's like, if you do that again, then you're not going to have this. And then 10 minutes later, you have to follow through with whatever because there's just no way to enforce it. Okay, so only select options you're willing to enforce. Don't intervene before the consequence takes place. This is a huge one because if our children are, um, like, if they know that they, okay, so, for example, you're on the playground. It's always the playground. Um, and your child does something and is upset and you pick them up and you carry them away because you're reinforcing or you're enforcing a consequence. You're saying, okay, if you do that again, then you have to come sit over here on the bench with me. So as soon as they do it, you take them, you pick them up and you take, you're starting to take them to the bench. No, 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 I'm going to be good. I'm going to be good. I'm going to be good. And so you're like, okay, here's another chance. 
they did not fully feel the consequence. You didn't follow through all the way. So follow through and then give them another chance. But don't intervene before the consequence takes place. Um, and I mean, we do that kind of stuff all the time too because you're like, I do want to give them another chance. And it's so good to give them another chance. But if you're already in the middle of enforcing a consequence, don't intervene. Just carry it through. Um, if you feel empathy for your child, though, offer a chance to try it again. So this would be before you start the consequence. You say, hey, I noticed you just did this. Do we need to go sit down, or are you going to have one more chance, or something like that? So you don't like pick them up, and then they like, oh, no, I can't, and then they get out of it. It's like before you enforce the consequence. Um, consequences should not be arbitrary, threatening, or punitive. So if your four-year-old is misbehaving, you don't go put them in your baby's crib, right? You just don't do that, and especially if you're at a center. I cannot emphasize that enough. Um, same, I, I mean, there's a certain school in this valley who's probably doing a lot of these kind of arbitrary, threatening, punitive consequences, um, where it's like, if you do that again, you can't ride the bus, and then all of a sudden they're kicked off the bus. It's like, okay, you could have started with like a lesser consequence, but now you did that, and you have to fall through, and now it's like super messed up. Um, okay. And then plan for consequences ahead of time. This is a huge tip because it can hurt the relationship. If we're so frustrated with the behavior and we overreact, it can hurt our relationship because we lash out, we overreact. Um, we're so angry, we're so upset. If our child comes out of bedtime like 60 times and you're like, just go in your bed, um, it's frustrating and you lose your cool and you do something that you're probably going to regret later. And so, or just say something. Like, even if you're just not used to like yelling or losing your head, um, if you plan your consequences ahead of time, it can prevent that. So, for example, if a child's pushing a boundary again and again and again, you set the boundary and, and the consequence in the same sentence. So you say, okay, if you, you guys give me something different from the playground and bedtime. Um, we do this all the time at our house, but if you throw that toy one more time, the toy is going away. Yeah. Okay. So instead of them throwing the toy 50 times and you freaking out and throwing the toy at the ball and breaking it, the first time they throw that toy and do what the behavior is, you take it away. And then, wow, you didn't have to lose your head because you just enforced the consequence that you already were prepared for. Um, so uh, maybe, maybe that's a family rule. A lot of these can turn into family rules. Like if you do this, this will happen no matter what. If you hurt your sister, you have to go play somewhere else no matter what. Stuff like that. So if you can prepare for some of these consequences ahead of time. Obviously, you can't always do that, but it can help a ton. Um, and then options for actions or consequences should be, should be logically linked to the activity. So if your child doesn't stay in their bed and um, wakes up a lot, then maybe the logical consequences is the next day they have to take a nap or they have to take a quiet time in their room. That's related and linked, okay? Um, if your child, well, like anything where it's like they're pushing down their sister or they're like hurting or like, they're like not playing nicely, then either maybe the toy goes away or maybe they have to play in a different area or a different room. Okay, so that's logically linked. You Like you just don't wanna say, Okay, if you do this, then you lose TV because that's not related. Even though it's a very like rewarding thing, you can you can have them not do TV if they have a hard day, but you don't want to make that the consequence to this action because it's not teaching anything related to this action. Unless they throw the remote at the TV, then obviously no TV time is a logical logically linked activity. Oh, there it is. Reasonable, relatable, and respectful. Dr. Becky Bailey. So talk about consequences with your child before the activity or routine where the behavior is likely to occur. We just talked about that, planning ahead. So as soon as you get to the park in those green arrow moments, you talk about the consequences, you talk about the behaviors you want to see because you really want to focus on the positive. But if you know a behavior is going to happen and you set the stage and be like, if this happens, this will happen, and then you follow through, they know you need mean business. And it's going to take one or two times at the park before they realize, okay, I'm not, never going to do that again because they're serious. Um, I think it's funny because I'm like the favorite aunt in my family, but I'm also the most consistent. Like if they do something, I will fall through with it. If I say I'll fall through, I'll fall through, good and bad. So if you hit, then you don't get, you don't get to play in this room or whatever. Or if you throw this toy, then you don't get to play with this toy. But if you do this, 
then you get to do this cool art project. Or if you do this, you get to do this. So being consistent is like, it, like they know the first time you say something, you mean it. They're going to listen so much better. So always try to be consistent and just like follow through. When you say you're going to do something, do it. Um, remember that logical consequences help to teach the child about behavior that's expected and why it's expected. So discipline is meant to teach, not to punish or shame, but to teach. And so discipline is important because it is how we are taught. Um, because we don't, we like, you know, we want them to be happy and we want them to, to know the impact of their choices um, before they're out of our homes and into other situations where the impact of their choices is going to be dealt with differently out of our control. So also the quote on this page, discipline is not what we do to our children. It's something we develop within them. That's one of my favorites. Oh, wow. Sometimes I say stuff I forget is in here. Okay, so redirection. So another way we can deal with behavior um, that's happening is in the pantry or starts playing with the dog and just like hurting the dog. You move them onto an activity, be like, oh, here, look, you can color on this real quick or do something like, here's a screwdriver, try to unscrew this. Just like give, maybe not a screwdriver in that situation. <laughs> My child like plays with screwdrivers. Um, but anyways, what? If you do that, you'll come home one day and all your doors will fall off. Uh, seriously. Well, also, actually, my, my brother was, like, using a putty knife and, like, doing some work on the floor. And we look over and my son has a screwdriver and he's painted into the wall. So we have this wall in my house that's, like, all chopped up with a screwdriver. So, yeah, maybe not the screwdriver. He knows how to use it appropriately now. <laughs> He's just, we've had been doing home construction, so he sees the screwdriver be used a lot. So he always has a screwdriver. Um, okay, so just redirection is a really good one in that activity. So what I did is I pulled out the Lincoln Logs, and I was like, oh, come build with me and knock over my tower. Because he obviously wanted to do something that was, like, fun and, like, a little bit beyond what he's allowed to do. So I built a tower, and he kept knocking it over. And so he's not on the speakers anymore. He's doing what I want him to do. And all I did was redirect. I didn't say no, we don't do that, 16-month-old. I just, you know, moved him on. Okay, first then, um, this is exactly what I was talking about before. If you say that you're going to do something, then you do it. So with first then, you can say, first, we're going to do snack time. Then we're going to play outside. First, we're going to get ready for school then we can watch 20 minutes of the show. First, we're going to clean up, then we can, you know, so whatever you say first, then you do then, and it's a contingency, contingency statement. If the first does not happen, the then, then does not happen. So if they do not eat snack, or like not necessarily eating snack, but participate in sitting at snack, then they don't have the 20 minutes of TV time or whatever. Or if they don't get ready for school, then they don't have this game before school. Like, you know, it, it, if they don't do the first, they don't get the then. Um, so, but if you do this with positive things, then they realize first then, if you do the first, they do get the then. Um, so if you say first, we're going to, I don't know, any, anything, and then then something awesome. Um, when you do it and you follow through every time, then when you use this statement, it can really work. Um, first, we're going to get in your car seat, then I'll turn on a show in the car, or then I'll give you a book, or I don't want the reward to be TV every single time. Um, then, I'll, it's like, so say he like wants his food or something, or he wants a toy. First, you can do this, then you can get this because you want them to do the first, and so you give them something more rewarding as the second. Um, yes. yes. How do we avoid that turning into, like, I will only do this if I can do this second? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would not use it every time. Fade it, so when they follow along. Um, if, no, then no. Uh, I just wanted to know if I wrote about it. Um, so if they do, if you do first, then every single time, and they're like, so what, maybe what I would do is choices. You have this choice or this choice. 
And so then you still have the control of what's happening, but they still have control over what to choose. Because it sounds like in that situation, it would turn into a control thing. Like, I'll only do this if this. Um, so if that turns into a control thing, start with just two choices. Don't even use first then. Um, because the function or behavior would be control. And so then we have to redo responses. Man, it's like a big problem. Okay. If your child does not comply, because that's going to happen, right? This is on the next page, so don't you worry. Oh, so on this page, this is cool. It's a consequence practice. So you like for that behavior, and you can write whatever behaviors you want at the bottom. What's a logical consequence? How could you redirect it? What's an if-then statement? So you can practice like with all these common behaviors, the three different ways to respond, and then think about what would work best for my kid in, you know, X situation. So that's a good little thing to review. Okay, and then the do. So you state the do direction. So it's like, okay, um, we're going to go get in the car. It's time to go. It's time to go. Get in the car. Wait for compliance. Count to five silently. Sometimes our kids are just really slow at responding, and we're in a rush, and so then we get frustrated. But if we just count to five, okay. Ask the child again. It's time to go. Let's get in the car. They do not respond again after five seconds. Okay. I can help carry you to the car, or I can carry you to the car, or you can walk with my hand. Let's go. And then you just follow through and do it. So in that moment, you might have to help. But you give them two chances, and then you help. And so if you're doing this, like, power struggle for 15 minutes of you need to walk to the car. All right, come on, let's go. I said, let's go to the car. So the next time, you're going to do it six times, and then they're not going to go to the car. And you're going to do it ten times, and they're not going to go to the car. So you do do, do, follow through. Um, I did this with my son. I like was like, he like came up. I don't know what he did. I, it was so long ago and he was little, but I realized that I was doing exactly what I was not supposed to do. Um, so he like came up and like took my papers and like threw them across the room. And I was like, dude, go get my papers. I didn't say that because he was like one and a half. Um, no, he was like two. I'm like, can you please go get my papers? And he's like, just running around. I'm like, Charlie, please go get my papers. He's running around. Charlie please go get my papers. Mom needs her papers. You know, I like didn't want to get up. But if I had got up on the second time and just taught him, okay, come with me. Let's grab the papers, hand over hand, grab his hands, bring them back to the couch. Then he knows when I say, go get my papers, then I need him to, you know, go, go get my papers. And I'm not saying that like, if I'm just lazy on the couch and he needs to get my papers, that's just rude. But if he knocks over my stuff and he needs to bring it back, he needs to know that I'm serious about the follow through, right? So in this situation, do, do, follow through. Do not do, 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 Okay. So, um, let's try it. Appropriate ways we can respond to the new, ch to the challenging behavior. So, um, let's have, do I have, I don't think, okay, that's for your own self. Okay, so this is just on the screen. Um, okay. So what are some new consequences for crying and meltdown when get off screen time? <laughs> yes, there it is. I'm like, okay. Oh, okay. So just like think, okay, so how about this? For let's just do throw toys at the wall. Everyone think of a logical, a redirection, and an if then. And we'll just look at that example so we can make sure we grasp it. I did it in the wrong order. Perfect.
Okay. What is a logical consequence for throwing toys at the wall? Taking the toy away. And then do you give it back as soon as they're good? Yeah. <clears throat> Depends, I guess. <laughs> You're like, what's the, you know, what are you, is this a trick question? Time out. Time out, okay. So if it's a reoccurring <laughs> behavior that happens, I think, I think it's like knowing how often it happens. If it happens every time, then put the behavior above the fridge for the whole day. If it like just happened once, you know, maybe you try again in five minutes. So yeah, toys on timeout, that's so good. Um, okay, what's a redirection? We can play with it on the ground or we can throw things outside. Beautiful. So it's like you can throw this or you can do this with this toy. It's a redirection. So it's instead of talking about what they're doing wrong, you say what you can do with that toy. It's especially for kids who don't know what they're supposed to do with the toy. Like throwing anything because they love balls or something. Okay, then if then. <clears throat> First, um, so first then, doesn't see, sometimes this, these strategies don't totally work with every behavior. So you wouldn't be like, first, play like this, then you can throw the toy at the wall. You know what I mean? So in this one, it's not really relevant to do first then, but you could do if then, which is what's written there. So like, if you throw the toy at the wall, then this will happen. Um, okay, so um, reinforce, focus the behaviors you want, encourage what you like, take a picture of the behaviors you like, write a note. So after we teach the new school and we do the new responses, we have to remember to reinforce the things that we like. So if they do the new skill, if they handle disappointment appropriately, you celebrate it and you give so much attention to it and it's like the most awesome thing you've ever seen. Um, like if our kid earns like first place in the science fair, we're like, yeah, that's awesome. Or if they like learn a new word, you're like, that is so cool. Um, but sometimes we skip over when they're doing a behavior that we want because we're like, finally, they're doing this behavior we want. But that's the time we need to celebrate the most because that's what we need. Um, I'm going to let you write that real quick because I don't think it's in here. Reinforce. Okay. And then, um... We put it all together. So on page 16, it's kind of like a support plan for specific behaviors or things that we're worried about. So maybe you don't need this right this second. Maybe the preventatives are gonna work or just having some new consequences is gonna work. But if there's times that are still super challenging or behaviors that come up a lot, um, then this, this little chart is like perfect. So what Johnny does during bedtime why I think he does it, because escape bedtime. What can I do to prevent it? What new skills should I teach? Ideas for wondering how to teach the skill, and what can I do if the problem behavior occurs? So that's our new response. So I want you to think about this for like super common challenging times. Um, and I'm gonna have you like go home and do that because it might be something you wanna discuss, um, but it's using all of this together. So it's looking at my child's doing this, Here's why. So it's like figuring out the function. And then it's like, how are we going to prevent it? How are we going to teach it? What are we going to teach? And then how are we going to respond if it keeps happening? So what are the consequences? So it's putting it all together. It's kind of complicated, which is why we um, would love to offer home visits. If you want to talk more specifics about your home or your specific behavior plans, um, let me know. And I can come do a home visit, and we can talk about this more in depth. You guys can talk about it. You can email me, whatever you want because um, we want to make sure this sticks and is really helpful in your family. Um, and sometimes it requires a little bit more conversation to make that work. Um, so, I mean, we've talked about a lot of these throughout, so we're not going to go back to your examples now. But if you would like to set up a home visit, I have um, a form to do that. And then also I would love for you guys to fill out an anonymous survey so that I know if this was helpful. I um, appreciate you guys coming. If you guys have any questions, let me know. This one for each of you. I graduate, or I do my thesis defense on the 24th, so. So after, so after the 25th would be beautiful for me. Too. <laughs>